Uh, what has surprised me? That's a, that's a really good question. There's a lot that could surprise you. <laughs> Honestly, I never saw most of this happening here. You know, if God would have showed us this whole picture of where it is now, back then, I, there's no way I would have come because it's so huge and massive. I wish I would have known more about planning a church back then because then I don't think we would have. Yeah, we wouldn't have. We would have <laughs> just said, yeah, no, that's not for us. Oh, uh, we'll go someplace else yeah. because that was just, <laughs> that was tough. It's, it's a lot of work. But God kind of knows that, I think. And so he, he just kind of gives you a little bit at a time. Uh, what God has done, I, I never been in a church bigger than 200. So that this happened is like, again, why? I mean, how? You know, am I going to be obedient with that one thing he asked you to do? And it's, it's pretty powerful once you see it that way. You see it as a, a, a chance to be able to step into what he's already doing. Church just didn't, didn't work for me. My parents were uh, in ministry. They met in Bible college. Both of them were first generation believers and uh, meaning that they got into ministry, but they had never really grown up in a home where there was uh, discipleship and, and you know boundaries around Christianity. Their parents had gone to church some, but but when it came to being a pastor in a church and how to say no to people uh, without saying no to God so that you could actually have a family, my, my parents didn't really know how to do that. Uh, there were some fledgling church planning groups. Um, so when we moved to Payette, Idaho, and we were working with the church there, there was a fledgling group in Boise area. and. Uh, because we were really interested in planting churches, Bill became uh, kind of affiliated with that group. So we, we took our five kids, nine to three, and took a cut in salary and moved to Boise to plant a, a church. My focus at that time was to duplicate the church of my, of, of my experience. So it, it was, my church duplicate what their churches take their money duplicate that and it never worked oh people were one to Christ uh, so the churches grew uh, but it just didn't flourish and even though the churches grew I'm not sure the people grew uh, I was investing in church growth principles rather than biblical principles of, of sharing the gospel and making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. I never could get that third principle down there where they become disciple makers. So I raised up a number, I raised up budgets, I raised up leadership. But when Bobby and I left, the poor guy we hired to take our place so we could go plant another church was left with a nursery and people who didn't have a maturity. And that was, we were just so, so new. And idealistic, we really were. And if you talk to Jim and the girls, they will tell you that um, we started churches with the seven of us and uh, they did a lot of moving chairs um, and had a lot of experiences that uh, looking back, we thought we were really, uh, including everybody, they looked at it like, oh no, we have to go set up chairs again. 
And, you know, so that's that's Jim's uh, and the girls. They all remember those those days. Um, so we did that for a number of years. I think actually 14 church plants. So all the time that the kids were growing up, then uh, we were moving every two years, and uh, that was damaging to our family. Our home was. I was preaching good sermons on Sunday and doing good work, but Bobby and I had a broken home. And the fruit in Jim's life was all bitter fruit. And I've never been a rebel, but in my home was growing a rebel. Uh, I had come to the place in my childhood where I was, I was done with the church, I was done with uh, eventually God when I got into college but uh, uh, I, I I said yeah there's no way this is gonna be the life for me and so as I got older I really committed myself to being the best at something trying to prove my value to the world and so for me sports became the thing and so I poured my life into sports and you know and about every sport I could get a hold of uh, and got good at most of them and you know college level scholarship at, at a couple of them three of them but no matter what I did to win it didn't fill that hole winning you know didn't take away the shame the anger the guilt because I had been so filled with shame and guilt and the winning hadn't really uh, changed anything for me it still left me empty I had started dabbling with drugs and then alcohol uh, really became my thing and uh, by the time I'm in college now, I, I said I could quit anytime I wanted. I just didn't want to. Uh, and I was able to control it for a time so I could compete. But as time went on, I became less able to say no and to control it. And it started to control me. And now I'm, I'm getting in all kinds of trouble with the law. My scholarship is, is on, the, on the line. And, and uh, now I decide I want to quit, but now I realize it's a way bigger problem. Now, at the same time, my parents are uh, pursuing me, and yeah, they've got boundaries when I come home. Uh, I even had to stay out in a trailer outside because I, I, I didn't think, they didn't think I was safe, really. They didn't know what I was gonna do, all the partying and the, the craziness, and and so, uh, they had boundaries, but they still loved me no matter what I did, no matter how much I had humiliated them and embarrassed them. They just kept loving me, and and uh, and that led to when I'm at my darkest moment, they uh, pursue me and and start questioning me about my faith. And you know, Jim, you really need to allow God to come into your life if you're going to break this addiction, and which led to there is no God. You know, you believe what you believe, that's great. You're great people, but I don't believe that. And, and you know, no real intellectual believes in God. And, and, I, and I had heard that, that no reputable scientists had believed in God. And, and so my dad started sending me articles and different kinds of material to show me that there were like Nobel Peace Prize winning physicists and, and biologists who believed in God, which I didn't believe him when he told me, but then I read their arguments and, and I was like, wow, okay. That, that really impacted me on a couple of different things. First, why would these professors be telling me there's no, no uh, scientist who believes in God and when there clearly was? But secondly, um, there's a good reasons to believe in God. And so as I started to unpack that, uh, I came to the conclusion there was a God, but I, I decided that there was uh, there must be a God, but it wasn't the Christian God. About that time, my dad sent me a book from Josh McDowell. He was a historian who tried to disprove Christianity based on uh, the study of historiography. I was a history major and was going to graduate from uh, college to be a history teacher. And so I understood historiography and I kind of went, okay, that's an interesting concept. I'm gonna study 
uh, religion on the basis of history? Was it, is it based in truth? Is there some evidence for it? Uh, I'm gonna, like you do in history, I'm gonna do the same thing in religion because religions are in history and they claim they saw something and I was gonna use the same criteria. So I started studying different religions, um, Buddhism, Islam, Mormonism, the Baha'i, you know, you name it, I was, I was looking. And at that time, my dad challenged me uh, that I was afraid to look at Christianity. And that led to a bet. If I could prove Christianity wasn't true, he had to quit being a pastor. And if Christianity was true, I had to become a Christian. And so I decided, you know, as easy as it had been to, to discredit the rest of those religions, um, based on history and based on what I had been told about Christianity in my secular college, that the story had been written and rewritten, a whole bunch of is it, you know, mythology that grew over time, that there was no actual eyewitnesses, there's nothing to support the story. I believe that. And so I thought this was an easy bet. It, it, the problem was, as I started to look at the truth, I was again, again shocked by what these so-called scholars said about Christianity that wasn't true. So again, that fed my skepticism about what they were saying at the university level because it was easily refutable historically. There were great historians who, who were Christians and, and all these objections that I'd been told were true weren't true. And so at that point, I decided that uh, I believed Jesus was the Son of God because of the evidence, but also because no other religion could come close to the evidence for it. He showed up at my door one time and knocked on the door, so you know he's not welcome if he has to knock on his own door. And I went to the door and I said, yeah. He says, Dad, I'm not saved. And I said, how'd you find out? Well, I was talking to these girls and sharing all the stuff I know, but then I realized I don't know the Lord. And I said, what do you think you should do? And he says, I, I, I'd like to accept Christ. And I'd like to be baptized and I'd like to have a new start. And uh, he said, Dad, w w when I was young, you baptized me, but I was being baptized for my friends. They wanted to do it. Didn't mean a thing to me. And uh, so, I said, well, where do you want to do this? He says, down at the irrigation ditch down the street. <laughs> I said, well, let me get the girls and mom. So we went down there and he stepped in and I fell in and floated downstream. <laughs> I have to tell you, there's never been two days in a row that I have not watched God make a miracle out of jail. And a miracle that as a parent, I'd given up on. I was, I, I just, and it was just, it was crippling to me. And it just killed my hope for my family. And to watch God make a miracle out of him who I'd given up on is uh, the greatest thing. Because if he could get a hold of Jim, he could get a hold of my girls. If he could get a hold of my girls, he could get a hold of their children. And if that could happen in my family, so I'm not just preaching good sermons, but I'm seeing the fruit of the Holy Spirit lived out in our family. And I just want to give the Lord credit. When Jim was my son, he wasn't worth shooting. But when he became God's son, he's our treasure. When he came to Christ, he was still violently opposed to the church. And uh, it had, he didn't have any good memories of the church. Most of the, the memories he made bad, but that's neither here nor there. And again, as I said, I, I, was, I was like, okay, I'll take Jesus with no church because of my experience and belief about church. And my dad, a few weeks later, he challenged me uh, by saying, by telling me a story about what was going on in his church. He called me and said, hey, Jim, I, I have this problem in the church and I don't know what to do about it. I, I wanted to get your, your advice on it. And, and I said, well, if you're, if you're really wanting my advice, then what you probably ought to do is get out of the church. You know, if you weren't in the church, you wouldn't have these problems. And he kind of laughed. <laughs> well, what he was saying was, um, you know, he, he didn't want to go to church. You know, he wanted to 
serve the Lord. He wanted to love the Lord, but at first he didn't want to go to church. And uh, so Bill called him, and they were talking, and he said, uh, Jim, I have a problem. And Jim said, what is it? He said, well, we're at this church, and we've got this family that's just really dynamic, and they've really got a lot of potential. Uh, and they want to do things with me, but they don't like your mom. I, I was really frustrated by that because my mom is, I mean, in my mind, she's St. Bobby, and my dad could be irritating, but I love him. But my mom, I mean, I, she's amazing. And, and Jim says, what do you mean they don't like my mom? And he, Bill says, well, I, I don't know. They've invited me to supper, but they don't want me to bring, bring mom. So I said to him, uh, no, no, you, you can't be in relationship with them if they want you and not mom. You're a couple, you're married, that, no. And my dad paused on the phone when I said that, which meant, you know, after this much time with him, I knew he, I had said something, I'd stepped into something, I didn't quite know what it was. He paused, I'm like, oh boy. Yeah, that's kind of the way Jesus feels about his bride, the church. It's hard for us to love the Lord without loving what the Lord loves, his church. He's the groom, the church is his bride, which I, I didn't know that. I didn't, bride, that's female language. I'm a man and I, my first response is, I'm not a bride, I'm no one's bride. And he said, no, that's a, an analogy uh, that the Lord uses in the church or in the scriptures about the church. He's the groom and it's the bride of Christ. And, and I, I was like, where does it say that? By that time I believed the Bible is the word of God but I'd never read that, so he told me where to look, and I came back, and I'm like, wow, okay. Um, all right, well, I'll be in the church, but I will never be a pastor. I'm walking in Kmart, and uh, I see a girl, her name is Lori, and uh, I knew about her because she had been dating one of my other wrestling buddies the year before and she had broken up with them. And when this guy was dating her, and remember at the time I wasn't a Christian, uh, he would come in going, all she wants to do is go to church and she won't, she won't, you know, party or drink and all this stuff. And, and, you know, so I'm going, why are you even dating her? Get rid of her. And of course, then she ends up breaking up with him. Well, I see this girl. And I see her and I thought, first of all, she's really pretty. Secondly, I know she's strong and she's a Christian. I met Jim through and I, North Idaho College here in town. And <clears throat> we were both studying to be teachers and the plan was to have the summers off together, basically, um, was the plan. And God kind of had a whole different plan for sure. It was, you know, Jesus, but my parents, and it was Lori at that time in my life that led to um, a change in my life trajectory from alcoholic to, you know, wrestling was all I knew. That's who, my, who I idolized. That's how I learned about life to Jesus. And God brought me some friends and, and brought Lori into my life. And that led to this change of of purpose, of meaning. She's speaking to my life. My father's speaking into my life. I'm starting to be around other believers who are uh, being more successful with their addiction issues. And it led me out of this hole in my life that was really meaningless and purposeless. Uh, my dad had challenged me to start serving in church, and uh, which was an interesting uh, kind of uh, issue. I had been praying about uh, he had asked me to pray about serving in the church because I was bored with the church. And not long after that, um, the pastor came and asked me to lead a small group of, uh, you know, junior high and high school kids. There's only four of them, and I was the only one near the age. I was kind of in, not insulted, but I was like, why would you let someone like me work with your kids? And don't you know, I've only been sober not that long ago, and I was kind of, I was like, wow, you people are so trusting, and how do you know I'm not a terrible guy? And and I had this conversation with my dad, and he said, well, you could look at it like that, or you could go, you know, we've been praying about you getting involved. It seems like God's answering you. And so that ended up with me starting in married student housing with my wife, 
leading a small group of kids that went from four to 10 to 30 to 40 to 50. And this thing is just popping out. I can't be in my marriage student housing house anymore. And we got to go. We rented some offices that the church had. And, and now we got kids coming to, at the same time, though, my wrestling career, I'm thinking, I'm serving the Lord over here. Surely God is happy with me in my wrestling. And I'm going to be able to choose or I'm going to be able to accomplish my goal. Well, as this ministry started to grow, I get mono in college wrestling. Um, my wrestling career went down around my ears, and I was frustrated at God. I was angry. Now, at this point, I'm so glad I had people around me, my wife, my parents, the other folks that were saying, you know, God's directing your life, and he's, he's moving you, he's pruning you, and all this stuff. And I'm like, I don't care. I don't care if he wants to, I don't want to do this thing over here. And I'm going to be a teacher, I'm going to be a coach, and I want to go to the Olympics. And there was a whole year of really pressing in, in spite of how I felt. About uh, near the end of the year, this kind of collapsed my senior year in wrestling because of all that. The church comes to me and says, hey, maybe you ought to be a, maybe you ought to be a uh, pastor. Maybe you ought to go into ministry? And, and my answer is no. What happened was uh, Jim was student teaching and <clears throat> he, uh, he had some, a student who had uh, done really good in class and, and her grades started to drop really bad. So she, he met with her and was like, what's going on? Why are you, why are you for going from A's to F's? And she just broke down and started crying. And of course, he ended up sharing Christ with her and um, realized that day, like, what good is Christopher Columbus gonna do this girl? You know, she needs Jesus. So she, he shared Jesus with her. Well, he got pulled into the principal's office and was, you know, because it was a public school, he was told, you know, you can't do that. You know, you have to be careful. And he realized that day that, that's, that God wanted him to go into ministry. And so I went home and told my wife, um, I think I do need to think about this job in ministry because I, I can't just teach about Christopher Columbus and leave Jesus out at the school. We were married at the time and he came home and he said, you know, Lori, um, I think that God is wanting me to go into ministry. You know, what do you think of that? And I was pretty young in my faith at that time. I wasn't really raised in the church my whole life. And so I had a pretty simple-minded, you know, belief system, I guess you would say. Um, he, so when he asked me, I just was like, well, I, I know enough to know that you don't want to get eaten by a whale. So you better do what God says. and. If um, just don't ever ask me to wear pearls and sing because that was my view of pastor's wives. And so I moved from, okay, I'll never go to church to now I'm in a church, I'll never be a minister to now uh, I think I'm supposed to be a minister. And I went into youth ministry. So as we, as, as the youth group grew, um, the church there in Boise, um, you know, would, we would have to actually do fundraisers to stay on staff. Like we had to, we had no pay. And so they just didn't see the, the need for youth. And of course we did. So we, we were working regular jobs, going to school and doing fundraisers just to do youth ministry. So we learned a lot about, you know, what was really important to us is kids and youth and through that whole process. And he got to a place where there was some hard church experiences that happened and Jim was ready to not, to be done with ministry, really. The problem was is the church, adult church, didn't really want to do anything with these kids. It was more like it was theirs. Go do your own thing if you're in youth ministry. And there wasn't a lot of crossover from the kids coming into the church. There wasn't anything for him to do, but, but do what the adults were doing, which was sit and listen to a song. Our kids had learned to do life with other people, had served, gone on missions trips, did all these things. But in the adult church, you just came to church, shook hands, went home. And I became very frustrated with the, the uh, adult church. I thought maybe it was that church. And, and I, I went to Oregon City and again, started with a very small number of kids in a very old church. 
and the numbers of kids grew and pretty soon the adults are going, why are all these kids around here? And they break stuff and they're loud and why, you know, there was nothing for them. And so about that time, um, uh, Aaron and Kelly Couch, Aaron and Kelly were married. They had actually both been leaders in my small group when I was in Boise. Now I'm in Oregon City. And Aaron had just graduated. Uh, he was, I think he was 23 at the time. And I'm trying to lead our church to start changing and trying to lead up. Uh, I convinced the church there to hire Aaron to kind of come in and, and meet the parents of these kids and then move them from dropping their kids off to coming to church. And so Aaron, uh, he actually played guitar. I'd never had a music in a youth group before. And Kelly sang. So I'd come, have them come and meet all the parents, play in, for music for the first time in there in Oregon City. And then Aaron started doing a class. And all these parents started coming to church, but they would come to Sunday school and they wouldn't go to the adult church because the adult church was just terrible. There was nothing that that an unchurched person would want to be a part of. And and uh, and the church, I mean, it was bad enough that even church people weren't all that thrilled with it, but the church was set in its ways. And as the, the church started growing in youth ministry and now the parents, it became, there became a rift between the existing church and these new people, and it led to a decision to go. I, I knew I needed to go. And I came to the conclusion that I was going to go somewhere where I could affect a, different, a difference for the kids and to raise people up from within, these kids that would actually play a part in the church and a church that welcomed them and, and wanted them to, to join them in this mission where the adults did something and the kids did something and we did something together. And so I decided I would go be an adult pastor, but I was never gonna plant a church. Jim called and I said, he said, Dad, you know I never was gonna be a preacher. I said, I know. And he, he said, uh, and I'm certainly not gonna be a church planter. So the Lord worked on him for a little while and the end result is, he said, Dad, I think I'm gonna go plant a church. Where are you gonna plant this church? He says, I don't know. I says, well, I have a couple up in Coeur d'Alene where you went to college that would like to have a church. I'll put you in touch with them. So Jim and Lydia Grubb came into our life at that point. We were living in Medford, Oregon, and we were attending a, a Christian church down there. And uh, we were in, involved in small groups there. And so I applied for this job up in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, which I would love to have a job in Coeur d'Alene because we were both from Coeur uh, we were both from Idaho. We were looking at coming up here and being part of a church. We got here and um, there wasn't a church that was like the one that we had come from and uh, sort of startling uh, and so um, we actually jokingly said, oh, that's, well, we'll just start a church because we didn't know what that meant. I knew the fellow that was over the church planning organization in Idaho. So we actually called him and he said, oh, that would be amazing. He said, when can I come up? And uh, he was super excited because he knows, he knew that this would be a great place for a church plant. Um, so he did come and he said, I'm going back and I'm going to talk to the executive board of the church planning organization and, and, and you know, we'll just go from there, keep praying. Um, super nice guy. He went back home and they felt God was leading them to focus on a church plant in northern Utah, not northern Idaho. We were no man's land. Nobody wanted yeah, nobody to wanted work us. up here and <laughs> help us. I mean, they would do it down in Southern Idaho or Northern Utah or in Montana or Oregon. I mean, we're up here in no man's land. Nobody wanted to help Even us. Even the Washington church planner said, you know, we're more focused on things on the on the east side, so we wouldn't be able to, to help you. And I, I think at that point, I felt like, okay, strike one. I, I mean, we came up here, we we're hoping to get some help. Nope, not from any of the church planning associations. And so. So we kept praying. And so I went, oh, wait a minute. What about Bill Putman, who used to be a church planter in Idaho? We were really pushing for Bill to be our church planter. 
uh, and because he was really wanting to, and we knew him, Bill. Uh, and so we were all excited. And then when he said, no, I got to go back to Oregon to be with my mom. It's I really felt crushing. like yeah. strike two. Yeah, yeah. He did point at a picture on the wall of his son. And uh, he said, my son would be so good at this, except he would never do that because he's a successful uh, youth pastor in Oregon. And so we just, we just accepted that as a no and just kept praying. Strike three. <laughs> it's like, now what do we do? Yeah. We became friends with the Grubs because our kids went to the same private school, and we just really connected as friends. Uh, both Lydia and I definitely just uh, loved Jesus. We liked talking about him. And they just often would talk about how they moved here knowing that they were gonna be a part of planting a church up here. And so we would pray with them, our friends, about what they really felt like the Lord had put on their heart. And oh, this went on for a year or more where we would just pray with the grubs about what God had for them. And there was one day that Lydia and I were driving to Costco. Back then it was only in Spokane, so it was a thing. And Lydia just said, Debbie, I, I have to tell you that I really believe that you and Jeff are supposed to help us with this church that we know God has called Jim and I to be a part of. And I absolutely laughed at her and said, well, that's cute. Um, I'm so happy praying with you and for you. And I believe in what you and Jim want to do. Uh, but I know that Jeff and I are very content at the church we attend. And um, I love volunteering for the children's department. It's just a great fit. Oh, I think it was a week. I don't know if it was even a week. And I had to tell Jeff, I, well, I came home and told Jeff, and of course he laughed too. And then I said, honey, I keep thinking about what Lydia said and I keep praying about it. And I, I think we're supposed to help. So we told the grubs, okay, we're in. We're gonna pray with you. Um, but now we're gonna pray for all four of us as God directs us to whatever this church is supposed to be that you have in mind. And really our prayer at the very beginning was to pray for the leadership that God was gonna provide. That we were because to be- Because we were not it. Yeah. Our role was to pray and to listen and to pray for the leadership that he was going to bring. Yeah. There were times we got super discouraged because it felt like we were trying to do what God was asking us to do. And yet we'd keep, we'd keep hitting these walls. And what I understand now is they were doors that were closing because God wanted us to get where he wanted us to be, not where we thought we we needed to be. It was November uh, 18th, we, of I, 1997. I was, I was coming, I came home from lunch and we get this phone call from this guy uh, out of the blue and this Jim Putman guy. And uh, I heard that you guys want, were thinking about starting a church. Now, who is this? <laughs> this is Jim Putman. Like, I don't know who this person is. I've never met him. We asked Jim, well, well, what kind of church would you be interested in? And he started going through the same stuff. And so I was like, okay. I still had never met him. I never saw a picture of him. I didn't know anything about him. And so it, it was that phone call that um, so exciting because there was this potential. But some of the questions Jim asked us was, you know, how many of you are there and is there any money? And we'd been saving our tithe. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we mentioned the Rosses and then there, there were a few other people that had expressed interest. And so, um, he just wasn't too impressed. So basically he said, well, I'll be praying for you. And I said, great. And then it was just like a week or so later, he called and let us know that the Tri-State uh, Wrestling Tournament was gonna be happening and that he would like to meet us. I was out of town and Jeff was out of town. So Jim Grubb and Debbie Ross went to meet with, uh, with uh, uh, Jim Putman. 
Oh, Jim, am I, are we ever going to forget that? Well, wow. Meeting him and going, wow. Yeah, and I remember we were in this hotel room with these guys we didn't know. Yeah. And what I remember, Jim, is remember he always like, so tell me, tell me, tell me what are some doctrinal statements that you have? Tell me, I want to hear what you believe in. What, what What's your reason for wanting to start this church? Do you remember that? He was just like, whoo. And it was Aaron who was like, Settle down. Hey, let's just say <laughs> hi and share each other's names and a little bit about who we are. And they were they were very young. They were very young. Twenties. Was uh, Jim even thirty yet? Jim was thirty two and was Aaron it? was twenty four. Okay. Yeah. 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 We spent about an hour them just sharing what God was doing in their life and what they've been praying about. And after an hour with them, there was something about them that I knew. God was doing. It wasn't just them. They weren't just angry at all the other churches. They were, they were sincere. They were the real deal. And they, they asked me to pray about this. And so I agreed to pray. You know, I'd asked them, how many people are there? There are a couple families. Is there any money? No, there's no money. So you're asking me and my wife to come here uh, and start a church, get a regular job, or some way just start a church in a house and see where it went. And they, they said, well, we don't know about that. We just want you to pray. As we, as we started to pray and doors started to open, um, obviously finances were something to be talked about. And um, there wasn't a lot of money, you know, in, in the whole thing. But we felt like God really put it on our hearts that this is what he wanted us to do. So it, to me, it was, it, you know, because Jim was struggling more, I think, because he's the provider of like, well, I don't know about this money part, you know, and, and I just remember saying to him, just like, if this is really what God wants you to do, then, then he's going to provide and he will provide for us. That's, he's shown that to us. So about a week and a half later, I was at a, a tournament, and I had come to the decision I was I was leaving uh, the church I was at for sure. And I hadn't decided where I was going to go, but I had honestly been praying about this with my wife, with Lori. And as always, Lori was like, "Hey, if God's calling us there, no matter how hard it is, we need to do it." But but you better be sure, you know, for going there with just a couple of families. You know, I'd never been an adult pastor in youth ministry for almost 10 years. So anyway, I go to this wrestling tournament and there's a guy there that's just been a great wrestling coach. And uh, he's taken a really troubled team and turned it around. And he, he cared more about the kids than he did the wrestling, which I really cared about, but he was a good wrestling coach. So I, if I were gonna, was gonna leave, I wanted there to be somebody who cared about these kids as more like a father figure because so many of them had come from tough upbringings. The fun part about Jim and I, I would guess, looking back, I would say, we had a lot in common. We loved our kids. We we're fierce competitors. We both ended wrestling at Boise State, we found out later. And, uh, and I always admired Jim in his leadership. And I didn't know that he was even given me very much thought because I was not really a hard competitor. So I went up to this guy between rounds in the tournament and said, Roy, hey, I'd really like you to consider coming to Oregon City to be the head coach. And he was like, what do you mean? You can't leave, and why would you be leaving? And, and I said, you know, I'm a, I'm a pastor of a church, a youth pastor. I'm gonna go be an adult pastor. I do this so I get to be in the campuses with the kids, and it helps in youth ministry. And, and uh, he's like, hmm. He goes, uh, well, where, where are you gonna go? I said, I don't know, don't know. He goes, well, where would you go if you could choose? And I, I can't believe what came out of my mouth. Uh, my first response was, you know, I'd probably go to North Idaho. I met these two families. Even as I was saying it, I was like, man, I can't believe how far I've come in such a short period of time. I can't believe I'm saying this. And he goes, uh, well, okay, well, why don't you go there? I said, there's only a couple of families and it'd have to be a church plant. And it'd have to be, we'd start something with no money. And, and he, he didn't know what a church plant was. So I explained that to him and so I said, well, what does it take to start a church? And he goes, I don't know, I don't know, 
I had no idea. Though I, my parents had been church planning and I had been part of the setup crew, teardown crew, I never knew the logistics. And so I thought, I don't know, uh, I just threw out a number. I said probably a couple months salary, I'd probably take somebody with me. Uh, even then, I, I had talked to Aaron about if I went somewhere, would he go with me? Would he want to stay? So Aaron was already on my mind. And, uh, uh, you know, my dad always went with just the family, and Jesus always sent people out by twos. I'd take somebody with me, and i say a couple months' salary, probably have to find somebody place to rent for a meeting on the weekends. I don't know, we'd have to get some equipment. So I just threw out a number, $30,000. Well, Jim, I'm working on a project, and if, if it goes through, I'll give you the money. And he said, how much money do they pay you teachers at Lake Ridge? I go, I'm not a teacher. I'm a business guy. I do this to try to help these kids be better men. I said, are you serious about the money? He goes, yeah, this business deal has been held up for a year. If you guys pray and that business deal goes through, I'll give you that money.